Welcome to this very important uh, conference on uh, building the campaign for free speech. My name is Tina Workman. I'm the co-chair of Labour Against the Witch Hunt, um, which has been the um, organization driving this campaign forward, really. I should say from the outset that we are very much hoping that other organizations and individuals uh, affiliate to this group, join this group and help us to drive this forward. Um, I will uh, uh, just give a, sm a small intro before I bring in the first speakers. Um, I think just the last week I've, I've kept an eye on, on de developments on the question of free speak and, uh, speech and really the last week uh, has underlined why really the, the setting up of such a campaign is, is so very important. So we've heard, had the news that the Labour Party has indefinitely delayed, i.e. scrapped, uh, the publication of the findings of the Ford inquiry, which was looking into the leaked report that had detailed the, the abuse and the uh, abuse against uh, Corbyn, really, the Corbyn leadership by, by the party bureaucracy uh, and his supporters, of course, over the last five years. Unfortunately, it also showed um, how the Corbyn leadership mishandled uh, the allegations of anti-Semitism in, in the, in the Labour Party and how it decided, unfortunately, to uh, accept the lie that the Labour Party is overrun by, by anti-Semites. Um, this is a decision which is very much resonating with us today and has played a huge role, I believe, in, in creating the situation we're, we're in now and the tax on free speech that we are witnessing across the society. And it's not just, it, it never, it was, there was never any chance of this staying in the Labour Party and it really has moved into all areas of society, which makes it, this, this campaign um, um, very important. So the government has again put pressure on all uh, British university to sign up to the IRA misdefinition of anti-Semitism under the threat of, of defunding. So there have been a, a couple of universities who've been fighting back against this, but the pressure on these is immense. Um, we've seen our comrade and uh, supporter of Labour Against the Witch Hunt, Ken Loach, has again been uh, smeared as an anti-Semite in the national press. Uh, because he was due to speak in a, a university in Oxford, is, which is under enormous pressure to, to cancel the talk by him. Closer to home, we have seen, uh, have to witness the uh, no platforming uh, around the rally uh, called to oppose the second wave of suspensions from the Labour Party, uh, which was uh, called the Stop the Labour Lockout. Um, you know, we very much uh, are in, 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 in agreement with the comrades to oppose the second wave. We actually say that the first wave on over anti-Semitism is very important to oppose that as well. But it's hugely important to stand up for the, the right of free speech, as the organizers quite rightly put it. Put it. And then they went ahead and de-invited suspended um, SCLP secretary Esther Giles after somebody complained over what they think Esther's stance, might, uh, Esther's stance might be on the issue of trans rights. Nothing to do with free speech, nothing to do with the question of the Labour Party, etc. So it's a, a very, very, very dangerous route, road to go down in, 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 in my view, in our view. And it was absolutely crucial and important that Labour Against the Witch Hunt, Labour Left Alliance and the Labour in Exile Network um, spoke up about this in a joint statement. It's a shame not many more organizations did though. I think the Jewish Voice for Labour did a, a statement. There are so many differences on the left and the issue of trans rights, for example, versus, versus women's rights is a, is a big debate and it's not actually a black and white issue. And everybody who says it is a very clear and black and white issue is talking nonsense in my view. To outlaw one viewpoint is just the opposite actually of, of the culture of, of open debate that we need. We need transparency, comradely discussions of where we disagree and not just spout, uh, spouting platitudes about the things we do agree. There are also different views in the uh, law steering committee and no doubt in the audience as well. For example, over the usefulness uh, or, or not of, of no platforming so-called fascists and racists. Um, this is something which is coming up later today and we actually have, um, we have a specific debate on this, on this question or should there be unrestricted free speech. Uh, free speech. Um, personally, well, who cares about my personal view, but uh, too many of my comrades have recently been falsely accused of being racists and to make that makes me very skeptical about the tactics of calling for no platform of so-called racists who's defining it it's always a question there but like so many things this is certainly up for debate and should not be uh, seen as a principle set in stone under every uh, circumstances different circumstances different tactics 
So as I said, we will be discussing this issue later today as many other issues. Please check the running order, which is uh, in the uh, invitation you got from, from Zoom. I'll also put it into the chat in a moment. And um, uh, there's gonna be, it's this, I should stress that there's a working conference. So we have uh, intermixed um, discussing motions and taking decisions, but we're also hearing from a number of speakers who uh, are discussing different things around the issue of free speech and have been uh, really prominent in the, in the fight against the, the witch hunt, against the smear campaigns and for free speech. So first of all, um, I'm passing on apologies from Jackie Walker, uh, one of the first victims of the anti-Semitism smear campaign. Um, she's had the, the jab yesterday and she's feeling very poorly. She's uh, in the meeting listening uh, or will, will join us at some stage, perhaps might even contribute, but she's not feeling too well. So all the, all the best from us, comrade. Um, Jackie was with Chris Williamson and Tony Greenstein, one of the comrades who actually set up the forerunner of this campaign in the wake of the Board of Deputies demanding that anybody who shares a platform with an expelled member should be expelled themselves. <laughs> um, that's not happened yet, but the way things are going, I think it's only a matter of time. Before I bring in Chris Williamson, I'm very I'm going to introduce the first speaker, which is the, who is Graham Bash. Um, he is replacing uh, Jackie as the first speaker. He's um, uh, joining us as a member of the JBL and LRC steering committees, but he's speaking in a, in a personal capacity. And we are very glad to have him with us today. Hello, comrade. Well, greetings, comrade, from Jewish Voice for Labour. I am its political officer. Today I speak in a personal capacity, and let me say from the outset, it is a privilege to have a joint platform with Chris Williamson. The attack on free speech we are facing is unprecedented in my lifetime, an issue that goes well beyond the Labour Party, as Tina says. We are at a critical moment, having to fight for free speech simultaneously at a number of different levels. Firstly, of course, is the fight in the Labour Party. 52 years almost to the day I joined the party. This is the worst attack on free speech I have ever experienced. Even war criminal Tony Blair did not attempt to silence the opposition. Now a number of us face the threat of expulsion if we insist on telling the truth. The truth about Jeremy Corbyn on anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, on the report of the Equalities and Human Rights Commission, even talking about the witch hunt can get you witch hunted. And as Tina said, or speaking on the same platform as or defending those who have been expelled. Now we have resisted in the party without leadership from the top. In so many parties, we have said, no, we do not accept your diktat, we will tell the truth. We have repeated the words that Jeremy got suspended for in the first place. Yes, the scale of the problem of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party was dramatically overstated for political reasons. And I'm furious that Jewish members are being used as a political football in what is a blatantly factional manoeuvre. I, for one, can do without offensive references <clears throat> to the feelings of the Jewish community. Jewish people, like all peoples, are diverse. We are Zionists, non-Zionists, anti-Zionists. We are religious and we are secular. There is not a single Jewish voice, but this is more than just a fight for the Labour Party. Secondly, it is a fight against racism. And what is so disturbing is that the structural racism in British society today against black and Asian people is in the Labour Party sidelined, relegated, silenced. Never mind wind rush deportations, police violence, disproportionate imprisonment, economic injustice, Grenfell. Remember what the Chakrabarti report was into. It was into anti-Semitism and other forms of racism. The report denied it, but there is a hierarchy of anti-racism and we are prevented from saying so. As Mark Wadsworth found to his cost at the launch of the Chakrabarti report, when he reminded us that the narrative of anti-black racism was silence, what did the Labour Party do? We expelled him, as Jackie Walker found in the Labour Party papers in the disciplinary case against her, which referred to her, quotes, unhealthy obsession with the African Holocaust, words which the party refused to delete. 
Thirdly, this is a fight against the silencing of Palestinian voices, those voices which witness the occupation, the daily assaults, curfews, arbitrary arrests, detentions, house demolitions, travel restrictions, checkpoints, irrigation systems destroyed, exclusion and discrimination in the Israeli state and occupied territories. We have been told in the Labour Party we cannot say this, so let me say it. Israel is a racist endeavour, it is an apartheid state, it is a state, as Ian Papi so graphically put it, born of the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian people. For saying these things, many of us lifelong anti-racists are labelled as anti-Semitic, or if we are Jewish, as self-haters or even capos. These allegations are so deeply offensive. And in today's Labour Party, we are banned even from discussing a motion to support a charity bike ride for Palestinian children. And last and above all, this is about our right to think, interrogate, question, challenge. And we even face a clampdown on our right to discuss historical issues. We must be free to examine our histories on the basis that no peoples have a monopoly of truth or right. Victims of oppression in time can be become perpetrators of oppression. That is the dialectic of history, the interconnectedness of all peoples. That is our internationalist response against all forms of exceptionalism. Yes, to discuss historical events may be controversial, even to some offensive, but party members have been disciplined for talking about history. Above all, Ken Livingston for raising the issue of the Havara Agreement reached by some Zionists in Germany and in the United States, which led to the breaking of the anti-Hitler economic boycott. These are complex issues. We don't have to agree, but let's have those debates. We may learn something if we do, because to ban discussion about our histories leads to the outlawing of thought and ultimately to the burning of books, another lesson from history. Continue like this, and we will end up burning the books of Ian Pappy and so many others who tell the truth about Palestine, of Hannah Arendt and Primo Levi, whose universalism challenges the prevailing accepted hierarchies. And as Tina said, there are, now three, there are now threats to free speech in our universities, facing funding cuts if they don't implement the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. The fight back there is beginning. Only yesterday, the UCL Academic Board disavowed the IHRA edict, but the appalling attack on Ken Loach and St. Peter's College, uh, Oxford, continues when the head of the college apologised to Jewish students for allowing Ken onto a platform. The clampdown is becoming sinister. It's having an effect on the culture of the left too, where no platforming and silencing awkward, difficult, critical voices, and there are many of those here today I can see, when doing that is becoming too prevalent. We must learn how to debate with each other on the left, sharply by all means, but in a comradely and non-abusive manner debate, dialogue, rather than exclusion. We have a lot to learn from each other. And finally, in that spirit of dialogue, let me express some disagreement with the Charter under discussion today. In defending free speech, in my opinion, we must not go down the path of free speech, fundamentalism or absolutism, which treats free speech as an ahistorical principle or moral concept torn out of its historical context. Now I speak as a revolutionary socialist and our struggle is for the liberation of humankind and the survival of our planet under threat of extinction. Our defense of free speech is part of our liberation struggle, part of our class struggle, but even this principle can in certain conditions be turned into its opposite against us, a liberal fetish used to stifle our resistance to oppression. <laughs> Let me give two examples. When our ancestors, my father too, in the 1930s stopped Mosley's fascists from marching through the Jewish East End of London, they were, of course, infringing the right of fascists to free speech. Ditto our comrades in the German labor movement in the pre-Nazi period, when they, sometimes violently, attempted to break up Nazi meetings. They were fighting literally for their survival. In so doing, they infringed the principles of free speech for fascists, and they were right to do so. And finally, comrades, if this puts me in the invidious position of supporting the amendment to the Charter from Tony Greenstein, so be it. Thank you, comrades.
harsh words. <laughs> Thank you very much, Graham. That was a very good speech. Thank you. Um, next to speak is our comrade, Chris Williamson. Um, Chris has been the only MP who dared to stand with those in the Labour Party and the Labour Movement who were falsely accused of being anti-Semites. And for that, he was hounded out of the Labour Party. We might have differences with the comrade on our attitude to the Labour Party today, but we continue uh, to campaign side by side and in a very comradely way. We're very honoured to have you with us. Hello, Chris. Thanks very much indeed uh, for that introduction, uh, Tina. And um, yeah, you, you're absolutely right. I was uh, literally the only MP that was prepared to uh, stand up to the, the witch hunt to defend comrades who'd been falsely accused. The fact that I'd stood by Jackie Walker and Ken Livingston and Mark Wadsworth was then used against me. And I think part of the problem we have, or the, the problem that we have, is that the political class has been captured in this country. On both sides of the chamber, in the House of Commons, all political parties have been captured by the Zionist lobby and by uh, corporate capitalism, I'm a, I regret to, to say. And that includes, obviously, the Labour Party. And when Jeremy Corbyn came on to the scene, of course, he... He threatened the status quo and there was a concerted attempt, as we're all well aware, to undermine him and to use every dirty trick in the book to destabilise his leadership and to ultimately topple Jeremy Corbyn and to destroy any notion that the Labour Party might be able to implement a modest socialist domestic programme and an anti-imperialist foreign policy. And part of the problem was, you know, the, the grassroots, uh, those who claim to be socialists in the so-called socialist campaign group of Labour MPs, failed to speak out sufficiently. It's got to be said that the, it was the apologists for Israel, it was the, uh, uh, the apologists for neoliberalism and the military industrial complex. They are the people that made the running. They are the people that ensured that Jeremy Corbyn's uh, leadership was brought to an end. And we didn't push back strongly enough. The grassroots didn't push back strongly enough. The socialist campaign group of Labour MPs didn't push back strongly enough at all. And we allowed uh, comrades to be literally thrown under the bus one by one. I've described them as Jeremy Corbyn's Praetorian Guard were being systematically destroyed. And an old Jewish uh, fellow who uh, knows uh, somebody who told me that he'd said to her, the problem with Jeremy was that he was treating his friends as his enemies and his enemies as his friends. Now, that might be a bit too strong, but that was, in reality, what was happening because it was uh, people like uh, uh, Tom Watson and uh, Margaret Hodge uh, and uh, uh, various others in the Parliamentary Labour Party who were uh, using very robust language to attack Jeremy Corbyn. Everybody, I'm sure, well aware of the abuse that Margaret Hodge meted out to Jeremy behind the Speaker's chair in the House of Commons chamber. And no action was taken against her and very muted uh, response uh, to the outrageous uh, 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 confrontation that Jeremy was subjected to by her. I think things really started to go wrong, frankly, in terms of, uh, of free speech and go wrong for the whole project of an anti-imperialist foreign policy and a socialist uh, domestic agenda when the Labour National Executive Committee agreed to adopt the IHRA uh, uh, working definition of, uh, or examples of, of anti-Semitism in their working uh, definition. And uh, that really, I think, in many ways was the first domino. And we've seen as a consequence of that, uh, the situation getting completely out of hand. And many of us, and I remember being asked by the Jewish Voice for Labour to speak at a rally outside the Labour Party uh, National Executive Committee meeting, against the adoption, the full adoption of the IHRA examples. There was a, a huge uh, rally there in support of that. I think there was overwhelming support, it's got to be said, amongst the grassroots uh, for the party not to go down that road. But despite our best endeavors, the NEC in its wisdom, the leadership in its wisdom, they agreed to adopt it. And we've seen the consequences of that, of course. It's seen the witch hunt being stepped up uh, inside the Labour Party and outside the Labour Party as well, of course. And I regret to say it's useful idiots. It's people like uh, Owen Jones and the optics left who helped to facilitate the enemies of a socialist domestic agenda at home and an anti-imperialist foreign policy at home. They were falling over themselves 
to throw people like me and Jackie and others under the bus. An outrageous state of affairs. And of course, we know the role that the newspapers like The Guardian played in all that as well. And of course, as that led to us, that's led us to a situation where, as Graham has mentioned, and indeed Tina in her opening remarks, of uh, Gavin Williamson now, no relation, I've got to say, uh, threatening now universities with a funding cut if they don't adopt the IHRA. Now, it was wonderful, and, Ger and uh, Graham mentioned this, to see the UCA, uh, UCU, I beg your pardon's uh, academic board uh, re uh, re retracting the, the IHRA, and, that, and that's a welcome step, and we need to see more of that. And we need to, I think, ratchet up the support for the action that they've taken because part of the problem I think for me is and one of the reasons why I was pushing the socialist campaign group to be more robust on a range of different issues actually was that we needed to create the space really for, for, for Jeremy and, and others John McDonnell and so on to actually be more radical and to go further and to you know be able to to stand up to the uh, witch hunt but that didn't happen and so I think it's really important that that we raise our voices in support of the UCU's decision and to press other universities which uh, are going in the opposite direction. But we're seeing careers destroyed. The uh, academics are being uh, targeted, as, we've, as we know. Uh, people like Nathan Robertson, albeit a uh, US-based Guardian journalist, sacked over a satirical tweet, for goodness sake. I mean, I don't know if people are familiar with what he said. I've got it here. This tweet said, a couple of tweets, did you know that the US Congress is not actually allowed to authorize any new spending unless a portion of it's directed towards buying weapons for Israel. It's the law, and they clarify that by saying, or if not the uh, actually uh, the written law, then so ingrained in political custom as to uh, functionally be uh, indistinguishable from law. Now, he lost his job as a consequence of that. And, you know, <laughs> there was a lot of truth in what he was saying. I mean, 20% of, of Israel's uh, defense budget comes in the form of US uh, aid. And then, of course, we've seen the spectacle of people like Ken Loach being uh, witch hunted and uh, Oxford University apologising for the fact that, uh, that an event uh, that hosted him took place uh, on the university uh, campus. He was accused of having a history of blatant anti-Semitism. This is a complete lie. And we absolutely therefore have to speak out as loudly as we possibly can and demand others speak out loudly. People who are supposed to be socialists inside the Labour Party, people who are supposed to stand up and support the uh, Palestinian people, people who uh, claim to uh, favour an ethical foreign policy, their voices need to be heard and we need to be pushing them to actually raise those voices. And then we've got people like Kerry Ann Mendoza, the editor at large of the Canary, being uh, targeted by the Liberal Democrats in Wales because, and indeed the, the organisation, yes, uh, Cymru, the uh, Welsh independence uh, campaign because they had the temerity to admit Kerry Ann into their uh, membership. Uh, she's been targeted uh, by the Liberal uh, Democrats as, uh, as an out and out anti Seema. Absolutely despicable. And then we're seeing uh, organizations like YouTube um, uh, 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 sort of demonetizing and deplatforming. Uh, uh, platforms that uh, essentially, you know, peace platforms, but uh, people like, uh, you know, Lee Camp and, uh, and Graham Elwood, uh, who uh, uh, put the case for, for peace and, uh, and for justice, and they are seeing their platforms taken down and demonetized. So th there is a real substantial attack. It hasn't gone away. If anything, it's intensified since Jeremy Corbyn stepped down. We've seen that. Obviously, Jeremy had now has been suspended from the party. I think he's on course to be expelled from the Labour Party. And we therefore have to put a line in the sand. I mean, I've been urging this line in the sand to be drawn years ago. It never was. But we've absolutely got to make a stand now because it's very, very, very dangerous. It's not simply the Labour Party that is at risk here. It's our freedoms right across the piece. And I've already said, you know, in terms of academia, in terms of the media, in terms of uh, having the opportunity to uh, have, a, have a platform to, to speak out against injustice, not just about Israel on a range of different topics. Unless we make this stand, then it's a very, very, very slippery slope and very dangerous slippery slope. And so it's about solidarity. It's about standing together. We need to come together and make this case as robustly as we can to ensure that we can push back. And I'm hopeful that if we do that, we will succeed. Thank you very much, comrade. Um, 
I've not heard, uh, well, who knows, uh, if, if Jeremy Corbyn gets expelled, it, it probably wouldn't be that surprising. Um, okay, comrades. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you very much, Graham. We are now moving to the first part of our um, motions and discussing what the campaign should actually be called and its aims and uh, politics of it. I'm going to put the running order and agenda again into the chat. Um, we've just had 200 people in the meeting. I hope most of you will stay and participate in the decision-making now to take this campaign forward. Um, it's very important that we have meetings like this and discuss issues, but it's also hugely important that we actually build something that can resist uh, those attacks on free speech and in an organized manner. Um, I should say we do uh, reserve the right to kick out anybody who's displaying uh, abusive behavior or um, comments in the chat. Uh, this is not in contradiction to our campaign for free speech, but it's necessary to allow us to hold a democratic uh, and a transparent conference. Um, please do uh, consider putting yourself forward to the steering committee of this campaign. We're getting to that in the second part of our meeting. Um, and we also propose that we have um, affiliated organizations sending some uh, representative to drive the campaign forward. Um, so please check out check out the, the running order and the agenda. Um, I will also um, share it on occasion on the screen. Um, the first person to, uh, well, actually the, 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 our proposal for the name of the campaign and how to move the campaign forward is Tony Greenstein. Okay, thank you, comrades. Uh, and welcome to everyone who is in attendance. Uh, at this conference. You've heard from both Graham and Chris about the myriad attacks on freedom of speech. I remember over five years ago, I wrote an open letter to Palestine Solidarity Campaign saying, what started in the Labour Party would not stay in the Labour Party. And so it has proved. We now have a full spectrum attack on freedom of speech. I, I, I must confess, uh, regarding the events at St. Peter's College when there was an attempt by students to ban Ken Loach and the administration uh, quite rightly resisted that attempt. That in my day, students were radical and to the left of their administrations, not to the right of the university administrations. And likewise, today, the NUS, National Union of Students, supports the IHRA and it's their lecturers who oppose it. So there's been a complete reversal of roles. And our job really is to take the campaign forward. And the first thing is we have to decide on a name. My preference is for the Labour campaign for free speech, not because we are just fixed inside the Labour Party, but because that was where it started. And that is where the engine of the attack on free, free speech is continuing. But it's, of course, for you to decide. Likewise, uh, we are proposing that the campaign is taken forward by a steering committee of nine elected people who will have the ability to co-opt where and when necessary. If I can just give a few, uh, uh, a few uh, thoughts of my own uh, on this. When I was uh, suspended uh, in 2016, at the very beginning of the witch hunt, I said this, that the, the expulsions and the, the attacks were not about me. They were not about Jackie Walker. They were not about uh, Chris Williamson or Mark Wadsworth or whoever. The aim of the campaign was always about getting rid of Jeremy Corbyn in the end. Jeremy Corbyn's leadership was unacceptable to the ruling class, the establishment in this country, but also in the United States and Israel. The great tragedy of Corbyn and what I would call the soft left, or maybe in the case of momentum, the stupid left, is they didn't realize that. They really genuinely thought it had something to do with anti-Semitism. Uh, and we should be clear, the campaign that we witnessed had nothing whatsoever to do with anti-Semitism. It had nothing actually to do with Jews either. It was always focused on removing Corbyn and anti-Semitism gave them a certain sense of moral righteousness. Nothing more, nothing less. That doesn't mean there weren't a few anti-Semites in the Labour Party. There were, and there always have been, there always will be. A mass party of half a million people, of course, you're going to have a few anti-Jewish racists 
But isn't it strange that they never ever focused on people who are anti-black or anti-Muslim racist. It was always about anti-Semitism. And of course, because the left most is not anti-Semitic, they had to change the definition of anti-Semitism in order to make people fit in to what they wanted. So I think we, we should be clear. We also have to have a realistic assessment. that It's not all one way. Ken Loach did speak. In fact, the Jewish Chronicle has a leading article this week opposing the attempt by the board of deputies to silence him. So maybe there's a certain uh, dissent even within their ranks. Likewise, uh, the decision of UCL Academic Board is extremely important. They've withstood the pressure uh, and come out against the IHRA. We should not at all think that these things are signed and sealed. Kenneth Stern has been attacked by three of his co-drafters of the IHRA, who've written an open letter saying he wasn't the principal drafter. So they're, even, they're having those disputes as well. The Zionists themselves are to a, a, a significant extent, especially in America, divided. And I think we have to stand on the platform of free speech, of democratic rights, and to say that we, we are not gonna be silenced uh, whatsoever. And of course, we. Uh, as Chris mentioned, one of the leading uh, proponents of the attack on free speech isn't the Sun or the Daily Mail or the Daily Express. It's the Guardian, who, as you say, sacked one of their columnists over uh, an ironic, a satirical tweet. Not only the, their columnist, but the most brilliant political cartoonist in Britain, Steve Bell, has had his contract uh, terminated. Uh, as I said, when I was on a picket outside The Guardian, the only decent journalist they've got on set uh, at The Guardian. So this is the context in which the campaign is being taken forward. Uh, and I really, uh, I just one or two other, uh, other things uh, I, I would mention. The attack, of course, on Ken Livingston. I know Ken Livingston and Pam Bromley are going to court to try and obtain some form of order against the HRC for their abysmal report, a report that's really not worth the paper it's written on, a report uh, whose the commissioner who oversaw it, Alistair Henderson, we actually know uh, from his own uh, Facebook and uh, Twitter account, ticked likes on race baiting uh, journalists uh, and uh, people uh, such as that. He, he's of the far right. And that's where this report emanated. It's not worth the paper it's written on. And that's precisely why Keir Starmer will not allow any discussion on it because he knows it would fall to pieces if people were allowed a genuine debate. We have a fight on our hands, and I hope today we can come together to build that fight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, oops. I hope I've succeeded in sharing the screen. Yep. Yes, yeah. does it work? Okay, good. So this is the what we're discussing at the moment, comrades. This is the uh, our main aims and campaigning priorities. So we're opening this up for discussion. We also will have to take an a decision if which which name we're going for. Um, so we actually started out thinking to call ourselves the campaign to defend free speech, this one, and then we looked it up and there's like a dozen <laughs> campaigns for free speech, some of them a bit dodgy to put it mildly and uh, <laughs> American ones. Labour campaign for free speech is, as Tony says, uh, I think it highlights kind of where it came from this particular um, uh, attack on free speech and it's also not taken yet <laughs> so there's less confused less less chance of it being confused um with another campaign if if we use this name so could any anybody who would like to speak in this session could you please click raise hand and i can bring you up into in, into the discussion i've not got any speakers yet at the moment anybody nobody's put their hand up i hope this actually works <laughs> Um, okay, all right, we have one comrade, Les. Okay, Les, could you, um, I've asked you to unmute, there you are. Okay, you've got um, three minutes if you wish to speak, three minutes. Les, we can't hear you. You are unmuted, but I think there's something wrong with your, 
microphone perhaps. I'm taking uh, another comrade first, Shahada, and then if you, if you can work out your microphone. Oh, Shahada, I think she's gone. Oh. Can you hear me now? Oh, yes, we can hear you now. Thank you, Liz. Yeah, I'll be very brief. Yeah, thanks for thanks to Chris Williamson for quoting me. I'm the one who said that. Uh, in fact, the whole Corbyn leadership treated their enemies as their friends and their friends as their enemies. But my point here is on the title. Yes, yeah, certainly it needs something before the campaign to distinguish it from so many others. How about labor movement? Because labor could imply that it's basically the Labour Party, when what's needed is a campaign analogous campaign in all the trade unions, especially those that push the NEC to support the IHRA definition. So that's my brief suggestion. Uh, yeah, I don't, that could work. I'm gonna bring in Stan. I've asked you to unmute Stan, you need to click a button. Yeah, okay. No, yeah. I don't want to speak for long, but I think that the, uh, the attack on the Labour Party is very significant and uh, I know free speech, you could uh, consider free speech in a very general way as applying to society, but the, uh, if, if free speech is beaten in the Labour Party, in the Labour movement as a whole, then of course it spreads to the rest of society. Who's going to defend it? So the, the Labour movement always was the motor of uh, the struggle for democracy, and, uh, and I think that the title Labour is good. Um, yes, uh, I appreciate what Lev has just said, but I think... Uh, that's an, an extra word is uh, superfluous. Labour campaign for free speech is good. That identifies it very well and prioritises the struggle for free speech in the Labour Party and in the Labour movement. Um, in fact, it's most important there. If the working class is going to get itself together, overcome its uh, silly divisions that it's got on the left at the moment, then uh, it needs uh, we need thoroughgoing democracy within the Labour movement. That's the most important part of the campaign in my view. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. Okay, Shahada, please. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, I agree with Les and Stan. I think we have to put Labour in. They might oppose it. I don't know. They might say some issue with it associated with the party, but I think we just need to really go for this because I think I know people who have been taken off Facebook, WhatsApp, people are scared to tick anything in case there's repercussions. So I think let's use Labour. I think that's our background and take ownership of our party. I think it's really important that we do that. So, um, yeah, I think it's fantastic. Thank you, Shahada. Anybody else who would like to speak on this, please raise hand. Okay, Mike. Oops, sorry. Oh, this. Ooh, there was a mic just now who wanted to speak, but I can't see him. Could you click raise your hand, please, again? Okay, Mike Barston. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Um, it occurs to me from what you're saying that, um, I mean, I know that the, the Labour Party has been smeared and it's quite easy to my mind to smear socialists, left wingers, Labour Party. And as somebody just said, at a certain point, um, this might become bigger than the Labour Party. So I don't know whether calling it the Labour campaign is sort of making it just about a certain type of people, which can then be pushed into a corner. So, I mean, I don't know whether the British campaign for free speech is a little bit too sort of Nigel Farage direction, but I, I feel that, uh, you know, it's something to bear in mind that we don't, you know, make it too, you know, a bigger thing. It should be about the whole everybody in Britain when we're talking about free speech. Obviously, it's about the Labour Party, where it's emanating from, but as everybody's saying, it's, it's going into the whole society. So I think we need some way of making it more sort of generic for everybody which might be more of a success. I don't know, just a point I thought worth raising. So, so I don't what, are you, what are you suggesting concretely? Um, well, I've only just been heard about this just now, uh -huh. so I've never really time to think of it, but, but something, I don't know, I mean, the British, British uh, campaign for free speech, or I know I could see somebody shaking their head, mm. or maybe not that, but something less sort of in a, in a box that they can kick down the road, you know? I mean, they've been throwing everybody out there right center, and it's difficult for people to stand up for things. So I just think, I mean, it's not maybe not very helpful if nobody likes British, but something that's more ordinary people 
rather than a left wing or a Labour thing, just like an ordinary campaign, you know, somehow some word that would encapsulate that. Just a point that um, I just thought I'd throw in there. Thank you, comrade. Right. Yeah, I think the, the, the British one is the, not going to go down yeah. too well. <laughs> but if you can think of another suggestion, put it in the chat or chat uh, okay. to me directly. Okay, Caroline, yeah. please. Okay, people, people who need people are the luckiest people in the world. Right, I've, yeah, I take on board what <laughs> you're saying. I don't think it should be called Labour for Free Speech because that does sort of, that sort of, um, I, I agree that, you know, it's bigger than the Labour Party. I don't like the British for free speech. Um, I think people's campaign for truth and free speech, something like that, people's campaign for truth and free speech. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, comrade. Okay, David Evans, who's not the David Evans, <laughs> and it's your comrade. We've had this before. He's sure. <laughs> no, he's coming. First of all, it's the other one. First of all, it's the other one that's not the David Evans. All right? Sorry, the David obviously. Evans. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I really don't think we should look further than Labour campaign for free speech. I mean, it does reflect what it actually is, and it fits in with organizations like CPLD and, and other, other, other such uh, um, pressure groups, if you like. There's no reason why we shouldn't co collaborate or cooperate with other organizations, other similar organizations, but at the moment, it does seem to me it is focused on the Labour Party. And, you know, I, I think it's more important we discuss various other articles of the Constitution rather than this name, which, as I say, it seems to me to be the, the easiest, sim simplest, and uh, most direct um, expression of what we are. So I would go for a Labour campaign for free speech. Thank you. Thank you, comrades. Um, yes, this is not just about the name, this discussion. This is also, um, we're hoping about the question of our main aims and campaigning priorities. So if comrades could check out this uh, document and see if there's any other um, issues on that and any other comments on, on the actual document rather than just the, the name, though. So, it always gets people going, doesn't it? Okay, Jim and Marie, and I think we have to come to a decision. Okay, Jim, you sh you're next. You're speaking, please. Okay. Uh, well, on the on the thing as a whole, looks okay. I'm I'm sure we could add uh, day after day, item after item. Uh, I'd agree with the last speaker to keep it simple, Labour. Um, I note just in a trivial thing, I don't think any American uh, group would take this name because they can't spell Labour. But uh, whatever we call it, uh, you know, like broadening it out so ordinary people can understand what is it, whatever we call it, it's going to be traduced by the people who traduce. Um, so we need to decide, you know, this is what we want to call it. If you don't like it, um, um, Jewish Chronicle, uh, Margaret Hodge, etc., etc. et cetera. Um, hard luck. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, Marie, I think you had your hand up. Do you still want to speak? Yes, yes, please. Okay, there's your hand um, down. Okay, well, in, in the body of the document, um, it seems to be that we want free speech because we want the, the people, which is in fact those who sell their labor, that's the working class, we want them to have a say. It's not just us, it is in fact the, the human being sort of who has to have the right to speak. And this is exactly what the problem is. And it, I would, I would be glad if we could incorporate in the document um, democracy in the unions, because the, my GMB, um, they elected um, a leader with a ridiculous percentage of, of the membership. And I think it is like this in all the unions. And it's the unions that come to labor conferences and vote, one or two people vote in the name of millions of people. And I don't see pre preparations 
pro-democracy in their unions and then coming to the party with a view of, of, the, of the human being. Uh, it's only just the view of a few people who have interests. And so I wonder if it could be put in, we are against this and against that, but we are also for um, democracy in the trade unions. But I do not know how to formulate it. Okay, comrades, um, I'm going to share my screen now briefly, uh, unless there's anybody else. Okay, sorry, Terry. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Thanks very much. Yeah, um, just reading through the document, I mean, everything that's on the document is in relation to, from what I can read, uh, Labour Party in, uh, issues, Palestine, etc., etc. So I think that uh, it's quite simple to call it, it, it originates from the Labour Party and our issues, and we should call it the Labour Movement Campaign for Free Speech, because that's where it's originating from, that's what the uh, body of the document actually says. Um, and if it, if it relates to other wider issues in society, then that could be used as a basic platform for that wider discussion to come later. So I think we should call it Labour Movement Campaign for Free Speech because that's what it is, and it's based, it's emanating from our labor experiences. Thank you. Uh, James Hall, please. Uh, yeah, just on the question of name, um, I think probably we should be employing Dominic Cummings, who uh, has a very good way of uh, finding catchy things. I don't like campaign. Uh, it sounds a bit student politics. I don't like labor because we are guilty uh, in that of just remaining in our own little bubble and everyone here is no doubt very exercised by uh, the suppression of free speech in the Labour Party, but it is a wider campaign and should be. I would favour something very much uh, non-partisan politically, which can appeal to a wider range of people. Save free speech, snappy, three words. The Conservatives have realised long since the value of short, concise, snappy, easily off the tongue titles for things. And it's done them a lot of good. It's also got us out of Europe, hasn't it? Uh, for good or bad. Um, we, we have to be careful because the whole history of action on the left since 2015, 2016 has been reactive. And we have to somehow get to be proactive in all sorts of areas and particularly on the question of free speech. Uh, and again, I think seeing it too much from within our own little bubble and concerning the Labour Party is continuing to be reactive. Thank you. Thank you, comrade. Okay, we have six proposals now. Please check the document. We will gonna come to a vote, but we have got a couple more people who want to speak on this. Agnes, please. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can. Hi. Yeah. I'm a little bit worried about um, the word labor because it will be immediately shot down by you know whom. So um, like they will say, oh, it's Tony Greenstein and he's not even a member of the Labour Party and that sort of thing. So, and also what Mike Barston said that we need to open it. So how about something like free speech for all, for instance, free speech for all okay, okay thank you thank you dominic please yes thank you very much very quickly um i'm happy to support um labor campaign for free speech i think it's simpler and i think it it draws attention to if you like where the focus of the battle is at the moment um however i think if we if we do adopt that name there needs to be um something somewhere which clarifies that we want the whole of the Labour movement to be involved. So it's not just the Labour Party that this campaign applies to, also trade unions and other um, associated societies. Thank you. Thanks, comrade. Um, Shireen. Okay, Ooh, when somebody is typing away very wildly, could you um, <laughs> switch off your microphone? Shireen. Where are you, Shireen? Are you, have you got a, a camera? Sorry, I, we can't really hear you. Can you? Oops, there's something I wrong with you. Oh, there you are. Okay, yeah. 
thanks. Um, I just want to talk briefly about the aims, the main aims and campaigning priorities. I agree with everything that's there. I think they're all really important things. There's also a shutdown going on and persecution of women for talking about women's rights, um, which you mentioned at the beginning. I would really like to see an additional aim in there um, about opposing the persecution of women for talking about women's rights or opposing the persecution of anybody really for talking about women's rights. Thank you. Thank you, comrade. The way we've done this is actually it's in our charter where we are talking about um, against a zero tolerance policy on controversial issues, which, which includes the trans issue or the issues that are debated in our movement. Um, Andy and Leslie Phillips, I wonder who it is. One of you two. <laughs> Join. The one that's in the screen. Oh, yeah. um, just a couple of points. I, I, I think the last uh, contributor touched on what I was thinking that we should really be, uh, there should be something that addresses all issues of inequality in our mission statement. Um, and that could take in all the nine protected characteristics in the Equality Act. On, on the name, um, I can only add. Um, I'm a little concerned of the use of Labour. Um, I remain in the Labour Party myself at the moment, but um, like many people, it is a, a great struggle. And I've been in discussions with various comrades, many of whom are in different organisations, and I feel concentrated on the Labour Party could um, disbar some of them from wanting to take part. So... Um, there's been numerous suggestions of running the campaign for free speech, um, but it's just to speak about the Labour Party. I don't think it should be in there personally. Okay, look, I'm going to take one more person, otherwise we can go round and round in circle. Uh, Ian, please. Okay, yeah, can you hear me, yeah? Yep. Yeah. Just, uh, just a couple of points. I mean, on the, on the question of the, uh, the Labour the Labour, Labour campaign, I think it... it it's. I mean, I'm. I'm not. I'm not a member of the Labour Party. I used to be. I resigned after after uh, Starmer was elected, because I basically don't see that the Labour Party is supportable under a, with a Zionist in charge of the party who's openly hostile to Palestinian rights, etc. I mean, I think think a Labour movement campaign that encompasses encompasses people who are not in the Labour Party is essential. I think there's there's more and more people leaving the Labour Party, and by just posing as a as a Labour campaign. You're effectively excluding them, or you're pushing them away. You know, um, so I think several people have proposed that as, a, as an alternative name. I assume this is going to be an inclusive campaign that that, that that's based on the principles of working class democracy. I mean, if, I mean, I'm not. I, I'm very much on the opposite side of the uh, of the transsexual issue to to the the, you know, the to the likes of Esther F, F. Gild, etc. I'm very strongly in favour of trans rights. But I think this question should be debated properly it, 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 according to the norms of labour movement democracy. And the only way to defeat what I consider to be backward positions is by subjecting them to open debate. Unfortunately, in the past, uh, people have been excluded not for back for holding backward positions, but for holding the most advanced positions from some of the from, from some previous initiatives that have been able to, able to aim to fight witch hunts. I mean, our views on, on, on Zionism, which I'm not going to go into in detail here, but we, I was excluded as a supporter of socialist fight from Labour against the witch hunt three years ago. And uh, and that was, you know, that, that, that very much the opposite. I mean, that, I think the, the exclusion of ourselves didn't actually, for, for our particular brand of militant anti-Zionism and criticism of uh, of uh, of Jewish uh, Jew Jewish communal politics in, in 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 the United States and here, uh, didn't actually help. It, you know, but didn't actually stop people from being excluded from a whole cascade of of, of allegations of, of anti-Semitism, fake allegations against everybody else. I think I think that actually helped to embolden them in its own small way. So I think that that workers' democracy. A campaign, a campaign around labour movement democracy or free speech within the framework of the labour movement is essential. Uh, and, you know, it's not, to, I mean, the idea that we should just have, just have free speech for everybody, I totally oppose that. I think that, you know, free speech for fascists. Okay, can you wind up, please? Disastrous. That's Thank it. you. Okay. Um,
comrades. Uh, Tony is going to come in to sum up, but briefly I should say that Esther Giles is in favor of trans rights. I think this is exactly the problem we're talking about. Shout, somebody shouting transphobe at somebody doesn't make that person a transphobe. So we have to be a bit careful with these things. And um, Ian and Socialist Fight were expelled from Labour Against the Witch Hunt because they are peddling or were peddling what we believe are anti-Semitic views. And if we are, um, a, a powerful campaign that can say that these are smears and wrong uh, allegations of anti-Semitism. We also have to recognize when some theories are anti-Semitic. So Tony is coming in now, uh, a right of uh, reply, and then we're gonna uh, take a vote on this with a, a Zoom poll. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We've had uh, a whole variety of different uh, proposals, such as, for example, socialist campaign for free speech my belief is that we should be in faith we should be willing to work with those who are not socialist over yeah. what is a broad democratic demand but at the same time we should make it clear that the campaign to attack free speech the ca uh, starmer's campaign to silence free speech has originated in the labor party but our campaign will not exclude anyone uh, unless they are for example, a racist or a fascist, for example. But I also think we, we need to be clear about the basis and people haven't mentioned a whole number of our main aims and campaigning priorities. For example, ending the PREVENT programme, which demonises supporters of the Palestinians and Muslims in particular, stopping the prosecution of whistleblowers and journalists like Julian Assange, opposing the interference of the state in the running of political parties, such as the EHRC uh, report uh, on Labour so-called anti-Semitism, the same EHRC which refuses to do anything about uh, Islamophobia and racism inside the Tory party. So we should be quite clear that this is a wide ranging campaign and the name Labour will not restrict that in any way, shape or form. Not least because many of us are not no longer in the Labour Party. Uh, but our main, our main priority in a sense is rejecting the IHRA, which is now I think under quite severe attack. And we have to join in that attack. And we also have to <coughs> call on Liberty, the, so the ex-National Council for Civil Liberties, to get off the fence and start campaigning like its counterpart in the United States, the American Civil Liberties Union, for free speech on Palestine and Zionism. That is without any doubt. And when we see someone like Ken Livingston demonised and forced out of the Labour Party for referring to something which is historically correct, then that is outrageous. As it happens, at the time of the Havara, the trading agreement between the Zionist organization and Nazi Germany, the overwhelming majority of Jews supported a boycott of Nazi Germany. That was their instinctive reaction. The Zionists were amongst a very tiny handful, including bourgeois Zionist groups, which supported which opposed the boycott and supported trading with Nazi Germany. So we should be quite clear, but on the nature of the campaign or the name for the campaign, let's keep it simple. Labour campaign for free speech. It doesn't mean excluding anyone else. It simply says this campaign to silence us began in the Labour Party, but of course it has spread out to the universities, to campuses uh, and many other uh, places in the society. Thank you. Thank you, comrade. Okay, I'm <clears throat> launching a poll now. I hope that everybody can see it. Please vote on it. You can only vote for one name. And leave a few seconds. I can't bloody vote. I don't know. <laughs> Should Is be it on yes, your screen. <laughs> Should be on your screen, Tony. Yeah, I can't see how you click one particular option. Oh, you're a host. You can't vote. I can't vote. I'm counting out. <laughs> Me, Kevin, and Tony can't vote. <laughs> so <laughs> undemocratic. But I'm gonna. If it's close, uh, we're gonna ask for your vote. Okay, comrades are still voting. Um, 123 have voted of over 217 people in the meeting. Uh, which is very good participation. Usually, most people go to the toilet or make a cup of tea. 
still got voting going on, please uh, vote now. I'm going to count down uh, five, four, three, two. Oh, people are still voting. This is so exciting. My goodness. Why do you wait so long? <laughs> 155 have voted. Okay, comrades. I am going to bring this to a close now. Uh, 158 people have voted, and here is the result, which I hope you can all see. So we've had 45% um, or 71 votes for Labour campaign for free speech. Um, that's the most popular one. We have uh, the second place is Labour Movement Campaign for Free Speech uh, with 30, uh, 23 votes, 15%. Um, then comes Safe Free Speech. Okay, so this is uh, quite overwhelming, which is good. Um, oh, have I, have I, I've not shared it. Here you go. Can you now see it? Sorry about that. It's a uh, technology. So I can leave this on the screen for a bit like a little while longer so comrades can see it. So we didn't we didn't cheat or anything. <laughs> okay, thank you for this uh, first part of uh, our discussion. I'm very pleased to bring in a, a comrade now who has struggled for the right to, for free speech uh, as well as against apartheid for pretty much uh, no, maybe not all his life, but for a long time. Uh, Ronnie Casrills is joining us. I'm very pleased to welcome him to our meeting. Um, he was uh, a minister in, in Nelson Mandela's government and, of course, an uh, anti-apartheid veteran fighter. We're very pleased to welcome you, comrades. Hello. Hi there. Thanks so much. Um, Ronnie, you're very quiet. There's something wrong with your microphone, I think. It's yes, I see. You. OK. <laughs> you can hear me now, can you? Yes, you're very loud now. <laughs> Okay, like, like Tony, I'm BBC, born before computers, so I just had to adjust things. But comrades, it's absolutely a privilege to be with you. And I must say, maybe I shouldn't have voted, but I did, <laughs> given that I'm from South Africa, but it wouldn't have made much of a difference. Let me say at once um, that there's international solidarity. And we're with you in the face of this abominable witch hunt, comrades. Once the COVID is hopelessly defeated, I look forward to meeting many of you when we South Africans can once again visit little Britain. You'll make it big again, comrades. I'm not talking compass in there. Apartheid is defined by the United Nations as an institutionalized system of segregation in which a dominant race group oppresses another to perpetuate its control. You all know this, and you're aware that it's universally applicable. Those who cringe from the odious analogy can go take note of Israeli human rights group Betzalem's statement affirming that Israel is an apartheid state. Let them gaze into their navels Lady Hodge amongst them, whether Betzalem is anti-Semitic. Hopefully, some will wake up. Some will. The ISC has decided, as we know, that it has the right to investigate Israeli war crimes. And of course, true to form, Netanyahu has labeled this move anti-Semitic. Similarly, Israel's cynical apologists, courtesy of that IHRA's biased definition, attack upholders of Palestinian rights with that diversionary tool. In South Africa, the communist bogey was the all-embracing deflection strategy, which so appealed to Western powers. Wrapped within was raising various alarms, black peril, red peril, the onslaught on white Christian civilization. We've seen the chicanery played by the likes of Trump inciting fascist mobs and those in Europe and elsewhere. 
and it applies to Israel's leaders and their apologists in their incendiary words, justifying criminal deeds. It brings us to the issue of freedom of speech, your topic, a principle which has been alluded to today is not an invitation to a free for all, a license to say anything. The South African constitution, and I, I'm sure you know this, guarantees freedom of speech, but it does not extend this to recognition of incitement to violence, advocacy of hatred based on race, ethnicity, ethnicity gender or religion. And I must stress, we would not countenance Holocaust denialism in any way. The righteous judge the moral basis of ideas relevant to facts and analysis on what constitutes right and wrong, what justice and truth is all about. We teach this to our children if we could parent. It is not the purveying of harmful and dangerous lies under whatever ism. The case for Palestine concerns the factual and truthful narrative of a just cause, a just cause against a racist colonial system, a struggle in pursuit of justice, of freedom, equality, democracy, human rights, return of the refugees, property and land restitution, not unlike what we fought for in South Africa. And comrades, there can only be one truthful narrative, and that is one based on the facts, unlike the agenda of the witch hunters. You cannot be even handed in judging between oppressor and oppressed. That's the message we must always tell them. Defending freedom of speech is providing the real facts to the people. It's very important. We see the very opposite of this in Israel's machinations, white supremacist South Africa, and of course, Trumpism in America and elsewhere in the world, from Bolsonaro to Europe to Modi in India, falsification of the narrative manufacturing of fake news, ignoring context, assaulting truth and meaning. In such cases, critical thinking, critical thinking so vital to democracy, its lifeblood, has been absent or diminished from school curricula in such places and sweeps seeps like poison into higher education and the wider society, the harmful result renders a significant part of the populace vulnerable to all manner of conspiracy theories and racist manipulation. And we witness this eff effrontery of the Jewish Board of Deputies attempt to stop Ken Loach from addressing Oxford students. We warn them to beware the slippery slope. What's the next step? Consigning Ken's films to a bonfire? Zionists need to consider that. In taking your campaign forward, let me say our campaign, it is imperative to educate and raise awareness and build from the grassroots amongst the youth, women, workers, communities, the religions, sport and cultural sectors, consulting and uniting with allies on common programs of action. And comrades, finding common cause within your country, the British left as elsewhere, building a broad-based front across the world. That's what you will recall we managed in South Africa. We refused resistance within South Africa to that marvelous, powerful international solidarity, a weapon of BDS, boycott, divestment sanctions, which contributed and you helped to the toppling of apartheid. The great issue of freedom of speech is critical, critical to the struggle against the threat 
of neo-fascism and racism. And it's central to countering the deceit and hi hypocrisy which misconstrues what anti-Semitism is really about. Our opponents defend the indefensible. Those fighting for the truth against all forms of racism, discrimination, oppression, and exploitation, we will prevail, comrades. And I use your slogan of your conference, yes, it's time to stand up and be counted. Best wishes, comrades, in your deliberation. Thank you. Thank you so much, comrade. That was wonderful. Thank you very much, comrade. And I think um, you've already um, taken, uh, dealt with some of the issues that are coming on and up in our discussion today. So thank you for giving us Thanks. your view on, on that issue. <laughs> Um, comrades, we have now uh, 259 people in the meeting, uh, which is definitely the biggest conference I've ever been in, in a, at least in a Zoom meeting. So thank you very much uh, for, for joining us all. Um, comrades, we are moving on to our Charter for Free Speech, which is, has been drafted by the Steering Committee of Labour Against the Witch Hunt, but it is a, was a draft charter and we've had input from a number of, of comrades, from a number of organizations, um, and we're very thankful for, for, for this input. We just thought it was very, it's very important to actually define what we mean by free speech and why we are fighting for it. And um, what we're proposing is that uh, Kevin Bean will now move the charter for five minutes, and then we're gonna have two um, sessions discussing the charter, because as it turned out, and Ronnie has uh, referred to it, other comrades have already referred to it, there's probably a particular uh, controversy on the question of is free speech unrestricted or do we put restrictions on free speech? So we, uh, we've we decided uh, yesterday at our last conference arrangements committee to divide this discussion up we have two amendments, both uh, on you know opposing views on this matter, so that make uh, should make an interesting discussion that we're hoping uh, we're, we're allocating about half an hour to to that discussion. So um, Kevin Bean is going to move the the uh, motion now. Uh, the where is he? There you go. Okay, Kevin. Okay, thanks, Tina, and. Uh... I'm going to do what all speakers do when we're sort of halfway through the conference, and that is to say that all of the good points have already been taken by the comrades who've spoken. And I don't intend really to reiterate those. I think the examples that Tony has given about the attacks on free speech in uh, higher education, the, uh, the comments that Chris and uh, Graham made about the Labour Party are all really relevant, and I don't, um, I don't intend really to go over them. But I do, uh, just to claim the conference's indulgence, begin with my own personal example, because I think it's typical of why this campaign is so important. I'm, uh, I've been expelled from the Labour Party. My original offence, which led to a suspension, was essentially on the charge of denialism. And that was that I uh, argued that uh, the account of what had happened in my constituency Labour Party, which is Liverpool Wavertree, where Luciana Berger, our MP, came under opposition from the constituency for her refusal to support Jeremy Corbyn, that was turned into a core salaire of um, anti-Semitism. And comrades will remember, um, comrades in Liverpool certainly do, and there are some uh, comrades on this call, will remember that Lord Tom Watson uh, referred to my constituency Labour Party as, as, as racist thugs. And uh, my offence was to actually query that and to tell the truth, and to tell that truth in an internal Labour Party publication, and indeed to, um, to argue that what was going on was not just a smearing uh, of comrades, but it was an attempt to rewrite history, and to do so in support of the right wing and their attack upon a left-wing leader of the Labour Party. But as, uh, as other comrades of the discussion have said, this is much wider. This is a much wider issue than the Labour Party. And that's why this charter deals with six clearly uh, different areas. 
and I hope comrades will read the charter because some of the questions that have been asked and some of the points that were made in the last uh, debate, I think uh, refer to that. I want really to sort of work through the charter and to talk about the, the general position as it were. The demand for free speech and for free debate for a free press is an historic debate. It goes back really through all of recorded history where repressive regimes, whatever the society and whatever the time, have attempted to clamp down on opposition. And I suppose in the, um, in the, the modern era, at least what historians refer to as the modern era since the 15th or the 16th century, whether it be the church, whether it be the state, whether it be repressive regimes such as in Stalinist Russia or totalitarian fascist regimes like Nazi Germany, the attempt to control debate, to restrict debate, has been absolutely central to, to that. And the fight back for free speech is integral to the fight back for democracy. And in particular, the right to put forward alternative ideas, put forward ideas that challenge the status quo. Now, the slogan of, uh, of free speech is not a, a historical. I think it's very clearly linked to the situation we now find ourselves in. And I think in particular, the way that the Charter links a whole number of issues, such as state and corporate secrecy, and the right to free speech and discussion in the universities and indeed in public life, illustrates that breadth, illustrates that, those connections. A few, um, a few months ago, uh, a conference was held in the United States, uh, hosted by Mike Pompeo, on the question of anti-Semitism. And it was attended by such luminaries as Michael Gove and Luciana Berger, and indeed other leading uh, British and American politicians. What was interesting in that discussion wasn't just the the, the fake charges of anti-Semitism and linking anti-Semitism to the left and arguing that the left was essentially anti-Semitic. It was the idea that any sort of challenge to the status quo, whether that be in economic or social or political or military policy, that that too lacked in legitimacy. And an attempt was made at that conference and indeed in, in, in wider parts of society to argue that ideas of challenge are, uh, are essentially illegitimate. So it means that the, the type of approach of the PREVENT program, the smearing of comrades like Chris Williamson with anti-Semitism is I think part of a much wider whole. It goes beyond simply the internal functions in the Labour Party. What it's attempting to do is to limit any sort of opposition to the policies of governments and to the, uh, the capitalist system in general. And I think this is where the attacks on Jeremy Corbyn are so significant. Those I think were rooted in Jeremy Corbyn's uh, opposition, not just to, um, to Israeli policies in the occupied territories, but in fact to an opposition and a potential opposition to Western foreign policy, to NATO, and indeed to the United States uh, wars of interventions and its its role in the global uh, system. So that attack was, was, was not simply, I think, around anti-Semitism, it, it was a much wider smearing. And that's what makes this campaign so significant. Item two on the end to state and corporate secrecy, I think is a really important part here. It isn't just the role of the, of the state, in particular the state into the, institutions in clamping down on free speech. Um, we can all be fairly certain that some of the smears that have been directed against us have been directed from uh, state agencies or, um, or, or their uh, operatives in the labor movement. And you know the, the pro-capitalist leaders of our movement have always been willing to cooperate in that way. But it's also the way that the law is then used to limit uh, freedom of speech and freedom in, of investigation. And that's why uh, the case of Julian Assange, but numerous other journalists and investigators who attempt to look at what the state is doing and to expose it are in fact so important. We, uh, we, we need to defend that right because freedom of publication is an integral part of the right to freedom of speech. I think Tony's dealt very well with the IRHA and I won't go um, 
much beyond that, but simply to say that that has now become a blanket uh, way of shutting up all sorts of debate. Not as, I, not as you might just think on the question of Palestine, but indeed on wider areas of foreign policy. Um, can, and you, in, can you start winding up now? You're... Yeah, I will Thank do. Um, so just to, just to conclude then, this campaign goes far beyond both the labor movement, far beyond, I think, the issue of anti-Semitism, and is now part of a much wider strategy of delegitimizing all sorts of oppositional points of view. Virtually anybody who criticizes the status quo in foreign policy, in economic policy, or where else, is now being deemed either anti-Semitic or in some other way subversive and dusty denying our rights to free speech. My apologies for overstepping the mark, Tina. Always, always. Thank you, Conrad. Okay, I'm going to um, put on screen now these charter that we're discussing. Um, Labour Party Marxists are moving the First Amendment. Can I see who's speaking in moving this amendment? Could you raise your hand, please? Whoever wants to speak. Otherwise it falls. Um, I can't see. Kevin, can you see anybody having their hand up or do you know who's supposed to move this? Oh, John Bridge. Okay, you can't, you didn't raise your hand. Okay, um, I'm trying to find you now. Comrades, please try to do raise hand because otherwise it's really difficult to see who's speaking, etc. Okay, you need to unmute. I was, uh, desperately searching around for the um, raised hand function there. Thank you. Um, well, the question is, I think, um, should this be a campaign for free speech or should it be a campaign for free speech, but? Um, and it strikes me as very strange uh, to have a campaign for free speech uh, that then starts saying what um, we're actually wanting to stop in terms of uh, free expression. That doesn't mean, of course, that we're in favour uh, of our opponents. Uh, it's just the question of what is the best way to fight uh, our opponents? I suppose that uh, uh, in terms of uh, the discussion so far, uh, the best uh, example of that uh, is Zionism itself. Zionism is a form of racism. Uh, it's a form of racism um, that says that Jew and Gentile cannot live together. Are we a campaign therefore uh, that says that uh, Zionists should be no platform, that they shouldn't have the right for freedom of speech. We're also in a situation, if we're talking about the concrete, of where if you actually explicitly say, state that you are an anti-Zionist, we know exactly uh, the weapon that is being used against us. Uh, it is the Equalities Act. It, it is the uh, uh, IHRA. It, it is the accusation that we are racists. And therefore, the question is, do we actually fall down uh, uh, into that trap or do we actually stand uh, uh, for freedom of speech? Now, in terms of Tony's amendment, he quotes a judge uh, that says in the middle of a crowded cinema, shouting out fire is not freedom of speech. I agree. Nor is someone issuing an instruction to kill someone else an example of freedom of speech. But what we're talking about is the battle of ideas. And I'll just give you uh, a couple of other um, examples. I remember when uh, Tony Blair introduced his uh, Religious Hatred uh, Act, they actually specifically had to exclude the holy books. Uh, I.e., if you actually look at the Old Testament, uh, the Jewish Testament, the Hebrew Testament, whatever you want to call it, it is full of calls for a Holocaust, uh, for massacring, completely wiping out other people. Uh, if you look at the so-called New Testament, it is full of anti-Semitic slurs. It says that the Jews were responsible for killing the Son of God. If we look at the Quran, the same sort of thing can be said. So what, what we have to be clear on 
it is that we are for unrestricted freedom of speech. Now, anyone who says that doesn't mean uh, that we can't uh, fight people in the streets, uh, that we're not in favor of locking people up if, if necessary, uh, this is nonsense. Uh, we can actually clarify uh, these questions in debate uh, if we're asked. But no, freedom of speech should mean freedom of speech. We shouldn't be relying on Harriet Harman's e equality uh, uh, legislation. We should be relying on uh, the classical position of the working class movement, which recognizes that the freedom of speech, to quote uh, Karl Marx, comes with thorns. Uh, it comes with allowing people we disagree with uh, to express our, their views. Uh, even though those, those views are repugnant uh, as far as we are concerned. Just lastly... Okay, please hurry up, comrade. Of course, just lastly on that, I wanted to quote um, um, another one. I don't think it's particularly liberal. I don't think it's particularly ahistorical. Uh, and that's Leon Trotsky uh, wanting to go to the United States to testify why the Communist Party of the USA shouldn't be banned and why the US Nazi Party shouldn't be banned. That should be our position. That doesn't mean we're soft on Stalinism or aren't completely opposed uh, to Nazism and fascism. Quite the reverse. Thank you. Okay, comrade. Uh, Tony will now speak on his amendment. I've put it on the screen so comrades can see what we're actually discussing. These are amendments to item uh, point one in our draft charter. Tony, please. Okay, thank you, comrades. Uh, I am in favour of free speech, including free speech for those who are opposed to my particular point of view, of which one could assume that's probably the vast majority of people worldwide. However, I think there are limits to free speech, and those limits are when a fascist group advocates the wiping out, the extermination, or the relegation to a position of slavery or whatever of a particular ethnic or racial group. Let us be clear, the purpose of say the National Front, the BNP or groups like that when they call for free speech is precisely in order to deny free speech to their targets, whether it's Jews, Muslims or whoever. Free speech is not an absolute, it doesn't take place in a politically free context. It's part of society, if you like. Uh, I think we, be, we need to be clear. Opposing free speech for fascists is part of an essential self-defense for minorities, but also for the labor movement itself. And that was expressed in the idea of no passaran in Spain. We would not let the fascists triumph. And that was also clear in the East End of London at the Battle of Cable Street against Oswald Mosley's British Union of Fascists. Allowing free speech for fascists means denying free speech to everyone else. And you know, I mean, uh, I don't have many good things to say about my father who was a rabbi, but uh, he did participate in the Battle of Cable Street. And he told me, if you walk down the wrong street, then you would, if you were Jewish, you would get your head kicked in. Fascists don't believe in free speech. And when they exercise it, they do it, as I say, to deny it to everyone else. And that is why it's an essential measure of self-defense for the labor movement and for all oppressed groups that we cannot allow, for example, fascists to hold meetings out in the open. We, we have consistently, whenever fascists have organized meetings, we've opposed them and tried to stop them. The reason being is we know what the purpose and the reason for them is. And the, the position that John Bridge is arguing for is essentially a liberal absolutist defense of free speech, regardless of context. But even John says, well, uh, of course it doesn't apply to someone threatening to kill someone. I agree, but that's exactly what fascism does. It does threat to, threaten to kill people. It threatens to kill people en masse. And is it really being suggested that socialists and communists in Germany should have allowed the Nazis free speech and therefore the right to organize it, knowing full well that their program would end up in either the expulsion of all Jews or their extermination as 
uh, took place. I think that's absolutely absurd. And then John takes it, it makes it even more ridiculous is, when is he that says, "Winding up, soon, comrade." Yeah, sure. This is my last point. He says the Bible contains all sorts of threats to wipe out different people. I agree. The book of Joshua is a book of genocide. However, the Bible itself is not a document inciting racial hatred. It contains many things, including welcoming the stranger into your home. It's a mixture of different ideas, likewise the New Testament and the Koran. No, none of those religious documents are themselves an incitement to racial hatred and destruction. And therefore, I don't think we have any problem with it, although they're, of course, full of reactionary ideas. But where someone or where a political group advocates the wiping out of a particular ethnic group or where they say that there is a superior race, a master race and an inferior race, the untermentioned, then we have to be quite clear. In, in, in opposing free speech for fascism, we're actually defending free speech for everyone else. That is the key issue. We're not liberals, I hope. We're socialists and therefore we see it in a class context. Thank you. Thank you, comrade. Okay, um, we have to try and keep to two or three minutes now, if that's okay, comrades, um, in the discussion. I'm trying to finish this at 3.45 and take a vote then. Okay, um, Matthew first, then Steve, then James. Matthew, I've asked you to unmute. You have to press that button. Yeah, okay, fine. Thanks, Conrad. Um, no, I think that I agree with Tony. I mean, I think that the, the, in terms of, of fascists, I mean, it's a principal plank of fascist politics is the violent suppression of the left. You know, it, it, it absolutely central to, to, to what they are. And therefore, it's not a question of debate. It's a question of whether we suppress them or they suppress us. And it's not a question of, uh, you know, historical things either. I mean, if we look at what happened last month, in, in, in Washington, that mob uh, who, who assaulted the center of the imperialist um, hegemon's power was led by fascists, uh, which obviously at, at the behest of a chunk of the US ruling class. That's not, not a minor, minor act or, or, or some, something that was unprepared. Uh, and, and it did, did go down deep into the, into the state machine of the, uh, of the US. Now, the, 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 the ruling classes in various parts are, are either using or preparing to use fascism uh, because of the depth of the crisis. There's no question of it. Uh, and therefore, I think it's, very, it's extremely important that we should actually understand that sort of phenomenon and be prepared to fight it. I mean, certainly in, in, in this town in Glasgow, the left, for whatever its faults and their legion, it does not allow fascists to hold meetings or demonstrations at all uh, and we've been very successful in that over over a period of decades uh, and that's absolutely correct in my, my view and i think that, that this organization has to take that that position thanks thank you for keeping it brief um i'm taking um stan keeble next and then anita there we are successfully unmuted i think um Yes, uh, no, I, of course, I'm, uh, I, I don't like the caveats. Um, and uh, the, the problem is, well, I mean, the left has adopted this position sometime. A lot of the left has adopted a position of no platform for fascists and made it into a principle, whereas it should be a handy tactic that you can use. It's a legitimate tactic in certain circumstances. But we remember how the BMP was done in on question time. Mm -hmm while the SWP's Wayman Bennett was outside leading the crowd shouting, no platform for fascists. So the BBC put the BMP guru on the, on the uh, telly and he was, he was uh, uh, shredded. Brilliant way to do it. That's the battle of ideas. And that's what we want. We have to hear the bad ideas in order to deal with them. And uh, that's the point. And any, any restrictions that we accept, uh, they, they are bound to rebound on the left and uh, bring in backward ideas into the open is the way to destroy them, the way to draw out what they mean, uh, argue back against them. If you ban them, you just drive them underground and people still hold the backward views. 
we have to bring them out into the open and win the battle of ideas. We've got to win the vast majority of the population. If we want socialism, we've got to bring all those ideas out and, and uh, win the argument. Uh, the Equality Act, uh, Tony doesn't quite mention it, does he? He mentions the protected characteristics, but the Equality Act 2010, uh, somebody said it was uh, Gordon Brown's last gasp, um, is, uh, it, it's got these um, protected characteristics, but the issue is there that you, uh, the offences are harassment, discrimination, victimization, right? And of course those things, those things are, are things that you wouldn't want anyway, but that's not about free speech. We really don't need the caveats, we need the principle to be clear. We want openness of ideas and we want to contest backward ideas, not silence them. And who's going to choose who is going to ha who's going to be banned? We know that's already been done to us on a grand scale, hasn't it? So let's not uh, let's not forget what's just happened. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, I'm taking Anita now. Some people are having comrade, uh, problems with the raise hand function. Um, so please, it's either, check it out, it's either in the participants window at, mm. or in the reactions panel. Um, OK, Anita, please. Uh, well, good afternoon, comrades, and thank you very much for what you said just now. Um, as you can tell from my accent, I'm a Yankee. Uh, I've been here for 45 years. I left because of um, witch hunting, um, FBI. I was a young socialist for many years there and I came here. I'd like to really challenge what people, uh, particularly uh, my male comrades are saying about no platform for anybody. Um, I think we delude ourselves if we don't understand who has the power in this capitalist society. And that is the right wing has the power. They have the press. And um, so just in, from an American point of view, we have a different history, different culture. We have a bill of rights, which in which freedom of speech and freedom of religion as, as relates to things is enshrined. The, the ACLU supports freedom of speech for the Ku Klux Klan. Um, and when I came to Britain, I remember I came in the middle of all this no platforming uh, with the National Front and that. And I just think it's, I just, I've, I've always fought it. Um, I think we have to have more confidence, comrades, for God's sake. I mean, don't you think our ideas can stand up to a debate with a fascist? I've debated Anne Whittaker on television, you know, with pickled fetuses and people in wheelchairs across on the other side of the studio. Come on, let's just get real, have a bit more confidence in our ideas. Why spend all that time giving attention to the so-called fascists? Some of these people aren't fascists, they're just deluded. Um, so I just like to say that I think we just need to have a bit more confidence and have a totally open approach. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, comrade. Steve, please, next. Yeah, hi there. Um, I'd just like to refer to um, shouting fire in a crowded theater that was used by Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. And um, that was so they can go after socialists. Uh, for instance, uh, Eugene Debs. And uh, I'd also refer to, um, you know, Anita talking about how we defend the Ku Klux Klan. But um, remember the uh, Stogie case, right? That was uh, in Chicago. The uh, Nazi, the American Nazi Party, wanted to have a uh, march or demonstration. And uh, it was banned. It was a big Jewish community there. It was banned. It went to the Supreme Court, and uh, they found in favor of the Nazis. And their lawyer from the ACLU was Jewish, and he caught hell for doing that. But he, was, he wasn't defending the Nazis. He was defending free speech. Okay, so that's, that's my two cents worth. That's it. Thank you, comrade. Thank you. James Hall, please. I don't often disagree with Tony, but I've got to say on this one, he's talking some nonsense. <coughs> Free speech is indivisible. The minute you start saying we have freedom of speech, but we have to know platform this, that and the other person, you're actually reducing free speech to the freedom to say things I agree with. 
There's there's no two ways about that, I'm afraid. Stan has mentioned uh, Nick Griffin on Question Time. What a good thing he the, the no platformers there failed because he showed himself for what he was. Uh, we have enough conspiracy theory going on at the moment. Surely we must recognise that one of the best recruiting sergeants for Tommy Robinson and his crowd, for instance, <laughs> is to be able to say they are conspiring to shut us up. Stan is quite right. Let these people come out with their ideas and let us discredit them. Let's have enough confidence in our own ideas and our own arguments to combat it. Now, authoritarian regimes and, and fascist regimes, one of the first things they do is to clamp down on free speech. And what are we doing? Unless we support absolute freedom of speech, then we are using their tactics. And by doing so, we are legitimating those tactics. Mm. Now, the Israelis say, ooh, all these anti-Zionists want to kill us all and drive us into the sea. From their point of view, given that some of them may actually be honest with that, uh, all anti-Zionists should be banned because they're dangerous. Now, if we can't tell the difference between uh, some bunch of random fascists uh, talking about their ideas and some random bunch of fascists getting together somewhere as a lynching party out looking for the nearest Jew or black person or whatever, then we're very bereft of ideas. You know, some judgment has to come into these things, I'm afraid. Uh, but can you wind up now, comrade? Yeah. Please? Thank well, you. All we're doing by aping the tactics of the fascists, which is what we're doing if we put limits on free speech, is actually aiding them. We're not fighting them at all. Thank mm. you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to I'm going to have time to take two more people, I think. Um, Dave Hill, please. Could you unmute yourself? Yeah, OK. Uh, can you hear me, comrades? Yes, I can. Two minutes, yeah. please, if you can. Well, mine will be uh, less than a minute. I just want to give a quote from Leon Trotsky, which I wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly agree with. If you cannot convince a fascist, acquaint his head with the pavement. These people, comrades, are out to kill us. They're out to enslave us. We want, we mustn't give them any space for that. Tony Greenstein, my final sentence. Tony Greenstein mentioned about uh, about fighting fascists, and uh, Tony and I have been on so many anti-fascist demonstrations in, uh, in in Brighton and and nationally, nationally. So do we demonstrate against them? Stop them marching, but say, oh, but you can say what you want where you want. Of course, we don't. We stop them. Thank you, comrade. Um, Jerry, two minutes. Oh. Okay, uh, uh, I, I strongly agree with Tony Greenstein here. I want to recount you. Uh, uh, when I was in the old WRP, we used to sell the news line up and down the Kilburn High Road uh, in the pubs. Uh, in the pubs, you would meet people that would make racist comments uh, about immigrants and black people and all that. And you would stop and you would challenge them. And very quickly, you would discover whether they were a confused worker or actually a supporter of the National Front. And you would not continue to discuss with the supporter of the National Front, but you would continue to discuss with the racist who had read his, his stuff in the sun or the, or, the, or, the, or the mirror the day before. There is a qualitative difference between a, a racist and a fascist. There's a qualitative difference between those, as the previous speaker have just said, who are intent to, to, to kill us uh, uh, and, and, and to wipe us out, uh, and people that are confused. And you must make that difference. Traditional labor movement, no platform for fascists, no space for fascists if they come for you. And it's not just a battle of ideas. It's a battle of physical force. And that's how it is always finished in the end. Hitler did not come to power simply by a question of his ideas won and the ideas of the opposition lost. He did it by absolute physical force. Uh, and the, 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 the Can you wind up foolish, now, comrade, please? Yeah, yeah. The very foolish organizations of the working class that, uh, that denounce physical force, denounce revolution itself. 
Thank you. Um, I'm going to give the the movers of the motions now two minutes each to um, reply to the debate. John, first, please. You are unmuted. It's okay. Yeah, I'm un unmuted. Okay. Yeah, interesting debate. Pity we haven't got more time. Um, standing for freedom of speech is not the same as not defending yourself. It's not the same as actually saying that uh, you can't launch a physical assault uh, on your opponents. It's not saying that at all, precisely. Uh, the, uh, the sort of principle has been quoted from uh, good old Leon Trotsky, convince if you can't convince, if you can't convince. So our prime job is to convince. And so what we're actually living in at the moment surely should convince us that that's the case because the weapons that we've been using without thinking about it, we must know platform as a principle has been turned against us. Mm -hmm. So precisely the Zionists have turned it against us. They say that their opponents, it's already been said, want to wipe out all Jews in Israel or something along those lines. And Jew cannot live together. And when we disagree with them, we get accused of being racists. We want a rational debate with these people and we will destroy them uh, in that we should have confidence in our ideas. Our ideas are superior. Our ideas are true. If we stand for freedom of speech, we can win. If we don't stand for freedom of speech, then I'm afraid that we dig ourselves deeper into the very deep hole that we find ourselves in at the moment. John Bridge. Thank you. Um, Tony, please. He often appears okay. to me. Yeah. Thank you, comrades. We indeed defend freedom of speech. That is why we deny it to the fascists, precisely because their purpose is not to win the battle of ideas. Fascists aren't interested in the battle of ideas. They are interested in killing us, destroying us, exterminating the labor movement and the working class organizations. The idea that you allow an Adolf Hitler to organize, to hold meetings openly, to rouse the masses against the working class Jews and whoever else. And then when they get strong, you have to then defend yourself and fight back against them and then try and stop their meetings is absolutely absurd. You want to keep the fascists as weak as possible. Look, in Brighton in the early 80s, when I was secretary of the local anti-Nazi league, we had a position where the National Front were going around wrecking meetings of gay groups, troops out of Ireland meetings, and other associated left-wing meetings. We had to stop them. The idea that we allowed them to meet and hold their own meetings and then attract other people on a very basic, simple, demagogic basis is absolutely absurd. The fight against fascism is a war that socialists have to win. And by and large, we have won it in this country. The, the, the very notion that we then allow them to organize, to grow stronger in order that, that they can then attack us and att to attack all minorities is absolutely nonsense. It is, as Graham said before, completely ahistorical. Fascism seeks to destroy us. And there was a battle, a war, which unfortunately was lost in Spain against the Franco fascists. The idea that you would somehow allow these people to therefore meet openly and organize is cloud cuckoo land. Those of us who are. Henry, can you wind up now, please? It's quite clear. Anti fascism is ingrained in our very DNA. It is part of the battle for a free society, a free socialist society. And therefore, I would ask you to support my amendment and not what is really a bourgeois liberal alternative. Thank you. <laughs> All right. OK, comrades, that seems to be a really good subject to have a, a proper meeting on <laughs> when we can actually have a bit more time to discuss this issue in more detail. Um, Judging by the comments in the chat, a lot of people having trouble finding the raise hand button, which I was proposing to use for voting. Um, so I've drawn up a poll instead. So comrades, um, I'm going to take first the um, amendment from, oh no, it mentions both of them. Okay, so <laughs> this is a, a news to me, all of this. Okay, so we can have a poll on both of them, both amendments. They now should be on your screen. Um, you only have one vote in each um, amend to each amendment. You can vote against or, or abstain or in favor. 
because you can vote against both, you can vote in favor of both or abstain on both. Waiting a couple of minutes, comrades, please, if you're making a cup of tea or on the toilet, please come back now so you can vote. We had about 74, eight, 78, 80 people voting out of 200 participants. There's a lot of people making cups of tea <laughs> or, or being on the toilet. Okay, 120 have voted now. Um, please come back to vote. If you're somewhere nearby, I'm going to count down now from 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, this is exciting, 4, 3, oh my god, there's so many people still voting. Why do you wait to the last second? Do we get up to 150 people voting? 148 have voted so far, okay. I'm going to end the poll now and share the results so you can all see it. Okay, so, yes, that's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> what are you guys doing to me? <laughs> well, yes, well, this is a, a hotly debated issue, clearly. <laughs> you voted for both of them <laughs> in the interest of, I don't know, democracy, et cetera. This, this is what happens at, uh, <laughs> at uh, democratic conferences. Okay, well, we'll leave it to the steering committee to sort that one out. <laughs> but okay, thank you comrades for voting on this. So um, amendment by Labour Party Marxists has been uh, voted for by 46% in favour, um, 70 votes, 58 against, and the second amendment by Tony, 59 in favour. Can I suggest an interpretation? <clears throat> So we leave it to the uh, steering committee or, okay, go on. Just very briefly, the conference has voted for unrestricted freedom of speech and publication, but it's made an exception for fascists, basically. Hmm. That is the only way people who voted in favour of the first one would agree with that. I think we might have to. And also, <laughs> my amendment had a much higher majority. Yeah, well, I'm not sure. Oh, if you get over 50%, that usually means... Uh, it's gone through. Okay, well, um, we're going to have to leave this for now. Um, uh, it's an interesting result, surely. You okay, comrades, we are moving to the second part of the charter. We have a few um, people who are speaking with us. Um, I think, Tony, I think you're moving your second amendment now, but if you could do it really quickly. Yeah, okay, um, can I just yeah. have a quick... Uh, Yes, it's simply on the libel laws. I, I, I don't have a, an absolute commitment to my own resolution, but I thought I should move it since I have sued the campaign against anti-Semitism uh, for uh, libel and lost as well. Uh, but I do believe as a general rule and principle, the libel laws are used to restrict the right of people to exercise free speech. And they're only available to the rich, the powerful, and the privileged, by and large. They're not, there's no legal aid, and there never has been any legal aid for libel. So I would suggest we should support the abolition of the libel and defamation laws altogether, uh, which would then allow uh, a level playing field. It doesn't mean, therefore, you don't have redress against uh, the, the, the press, uh, which seeks to defame people uh, but I think there can be other avenues to explore. But as a broad principle, I think the libel laws are undemocratic. Thank you. Thank you, comrade. Um, okay, there's a couple of comrades that were being too rushed, which is, yes, always the problem in, a, in these kind of meetings. I think people get perhaps distracted and do something else and then they're not followed the debate. I'm, for, I'm afraid it's very difficult to do this via Zoom, but we're, we're doing the best we can. Nothing is set in stone. We can also always uh, revisit some things. Okay, um, now we have a, a couple of uh, people who've previously indicated they would like to speak on this issue, uh, including Esther Giles, Jamie Stern Weiner, um, David Miller, and Deepa Driver. Okay, I'm hoping comrades are ready. So I can bring you in now. Uh, Comrade Deepa, perhaps first, if you're ready. Um, is, hello, Comrade. She is a, um, a chair of Momentum 
Camden and involved in the Wikipedia, uh, sorry, not the Wikipedia, what am I talking about? WikiLeaks, <laughs> free Julian Assange campaign. So um, nice to see you, comrade. Um, if, three minutes, please, if, if possible. Thank you, Dina. Um, I'm here to um, request the Labour Left Alliance to take a strong stance in defence of Julian Assange. Um, for those of you who may be aware, the word torture comes from um, the Latin, which is to twist, and that is essentially a, a way of, shed, of, of hurting somebody without shedding blood in terms of the, uh, the Christian principles. And essentially that's what's been done to Julian Assange over the years. Uh, for those of you who may not know, um, I'd like to encourage, you to encourage you to put yourself in the shoes of Khalid al-Masri. Uh, he was a, lib um, um, a German citizen of Lebanese descent and um, he was abducted by the CIA, sodomized, uh, tortured for several months until they decided it was a case of mistaken identity. And they continued to torture him for a further few months, after which they, um, you know, once they got to their decision, they then let him loose on the Albanian border from where he was deported back to Germany, where nobody believed his story. And it was only because of the WikiLeaks releases where both Cablegate as well as releases in relation to um, to the torture of Mr. El Masri, that Mr. El Masri got some amount of restitution through the European Court of Human Rights. Now, Mr. El Masri's case is not unique. As many of you will know, American imperialism and British uh, involvement in supporting that, uh, or in fact leading it in some cases, has led to a, a complete um, legitimization of American imperialist behavior all over the world. And the role that WikiLeaks and Julian Assange played in, played in um, addressing this has been both in terms of the one, wonderful innovation that WikiLeaks did in terms of allowing whistleblowers to, um, to provide large volumes of information in a secure way to um, journalists, but also for that documentation to have its own security in that it, WikiLeaks still holds a 100% accuracy record which none of the mainstream media can even aspire to. In order to prevent us from recognizing what a trailblazer and pathbreaker Julian Assange was, and to avoid us from following his example in making governments accountable to the people for us to surveil the state rather than for the state to surveil us, a number of um, efforts have been undertaken predominantly by Britain, America, Sweden, Ecuador, and Australia in order to suppress both whistleblowers and Mr. Assange. He's currently in Belmarsh prison, uh, despite having, um, it, despite the court having decided, and I was a legal observer at this trial, having decided that Mr. Assange cannot be extradited to the US. And um, the, the joke about this was the judge said she wanted to be fair to the Americans in order that they would be able to carry um, their appeal more seriously. In all of this, you know, what um, Mr. Assange has been arbitrarily confined in the Ecuadorian embassy where his privileged conversations with his lawyers were spied upon, where um, his conversations with his medical experts were spied upon. He was not able to leave the embassy. The British government, particularly the Metropolitan Police, was involved in spending tens of millions of pounds surveilling the embassy, which as anybody who works in relation to women's rights will recognize the British don't really care about women's rights, in the, the British government at least, in the way in which they pros prosecute women's rights and deal with issues related to sexual violence. So this was about the state clamping down on a journalist. And what has happened as a result of Mr. Assange's case is that it is criminalizing both journalism and anybody who accepts classified data who is a recipient of it. And this case is really important for activists because if you were to disclose information that the American government found uncomfortable or opposed to their so-called national interests, they would be able to pluck you out, extradite you to the United States and put you in a maximum security prison where you will spend 22 hours a day in solitary confinement. In that prison, Mr. Assange, were he to be extradited, would be allowed individual recreation where he would be moved from his bare small cell 
to the next their small cell to spend some time individually recreating. And then in addition to that, were um, you know, his conversations even pre, um, pre-conviction would be censored by the FBI. He wouldn't be able to talk freely to his lawyers or to his family. He would be allowed two 15 minute calls a day. What Julian has done for the world has been to allow us to see what's really going on. Were it not for him, we would not know the realities of the Iraq and Afghan war. We would not know the realities of Trafigura dumping toxic waste outside the Ivory Coast. We have to recognize that this is a case of states colluding, colluding to support free speech. And those on the left must coalesce around this case because it is not just about Mr. Assange, which is what much of the story tends to be about vilifying him, talking about his personality, discussing whether he smears species on the wall. It is about the right of people to know the crimes that governments commit in our name. I'm really grateful to be here alongside the person who um, took the, um, the Assange case to Parliament in a, in a meaningful way, Chris Williamson, and other activists who are here, to, like David Miller, um, who I, who's recognize how important um, this case is for all of us. So I'd be very grateful for your support. Thank you. Thank you very much, Comrade. Thank you for joining us today. Very important campaign, and we're definitely in support of it. It's why um, you know we spend uh, the second point of our our charter is is on that case and in favor of whistleblowers uh, on from all levels. Okay, um, I'm David Miller now. Um, Deepa has referred to him. is from the University of Bristol and has also been in the spotlight <laughs> over the uh, anti-Semitism smear campaign. Thank you very much for joining us, Comrade. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, good to see you, Deepa. Uh, of course, uh, the Assange case is a, a landmark case, um, which uh, everyone should be uh, supporting. I, I wanted to say a few things about the, I've been invited to say a few things about the, the university sector uh, and uh, the uh, anti-Semitism, alleged anti-Semitism crisis. And I want to start by uh, say, say by agreeing and then disagreeing with Tony. Uh, I think this is what I do every time I come on. <laughs> First of all, uh, Tony is completely correct about free speech. It's not an unlimited right. You can't shout, shout fire in a crowded theatre and nor indeed can you uh, organize to uh, commit genocide and eliminate uh, an ethnic group. Uh, that's, done, that's not legitimate free speech. Now, someone's mentioned earlier uh, um, that a, a distinction between uh, talking about genocide and organizing genocide. Now, this is a distinction of no meaning whatsoever. The idea, uh, the thing which worries me about, one of the things which worries me about free speech, the idea of free speech is that it, it tries to or it diverts attention away from the fact that there are more things in the world than speech. Uh, there are actions in the world. The Palestinians are oppressed not just through speech and proper. Oops. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, Hello. Oh, that's good. Hello. Sorry, you were stuck Sorry. for a second there, but you can okay, go on. Uh, I mean, so, so you know, free speech, yes, it's an, an important principle, and of course, we have, we have to defend key, key cases like Julian Assange and, and others. But you know, the the enemy we face here is, is Zionism and uh, the the imperial policies of the Israeli state, uh, and free speech is not the main problem here, it seems to me. It's a problem, but not the main problem. So this is where I want to disagree with Tony, right? Tony said that on, on the, the question of naming the organization, that it started with the Labour Party. It didn't start with the Labour Party. It's not started with the Labour Party and moved to the universities. It's an all-out onslaught by the Israeli government, mainly through the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, but also other ministries too, on the left globally. And this is not something which just happened in Britain, just to the Labour Party, just to the universities, etc., which I'll come to, I'll talk about in a minute. It's also happened in France and Germany before it got to the the, the UK, and it happened in the, of course, it's been happening in the US as we saw with uh, Bernie Sanders and uh, Ilhan Omar, etc. This is a an all-out attack by the Israeli government. It's not something to do with the Labour Party, really. The Labour Party is, you know, a mere detail of this attempt by the Israelis to impose their will uh, all over the world, uh, and that, that's, I think, is what what we should. Recognize it's not just a question of uh, of um, 
of being allowed to say, oh, Zionism's bad or Zionism's racism, which of course we should be allowed to say because you know, it is. Uh, but also, it's not just a question of that, it's a question of how we defeat the ideology of Zionism in practice. How, how do we make sure that Zionism uh, is ended essentially? And there, I mean, there's no w other way than saying that. It's, it's, not, it's not enough for us to say Zionism is racism, uh, Israel is a settler colonial society. That, these, are, these are arguments we might make, yes, but the, the, end, the aim of this is not just to, to say things, but to end settler colonialism uh, in Palestine and to end Zionism as an ideology, as a functioning ideology of the world. And so that's the thing which, which worries me most about the idea of freedom of speech, is that it diverts our attention from the, the practical realities, the material, can I use that word, Tony? I think you would, you would approve of that, the material realities yeah. uh, of, um, of the jackboot on the neck of the Palestinians. So that's my, my, pre, my sort of, I agree with Tony, I don't agree with Tony uh, preamble. On to the question of the universities now. Uh, people have mentioned... Two um, minutes, comrades, please, yeah? Two, okay. Two minutes, okay. <laughs> people have mentioned um, the, the UCL vote, and this is, a, this is a dramatic event that uh, UCL have voted to uh, get rid of the IHRA. This is the first time it's happened. A um, uh, uh, concerted lobbying uh, effort by the Israelis uh, over the uh, holiday period and the new year to try and uh, undermine this possibility, but people have stood firm and voted against the IHRA. And this is the, this is the beginning of our fight back. Uh, and I, I want to say a few words about that very quickly. I mean, the, the people will probably be, be aware that they, the, of the four options which were on the, the ballot, the option which has been favored is the option to withdraw the IHRA, but to replace it with something else. Now, this is the second best option in my view, which they should have just been uh, retracted and uh, uh, not replaced. But we face, as a result, uh, a huge struggle over what will, it will be replaced with. Now, of course, the Zionists will come up and they already are planning uh, their, uh, uh, their alternative to the IHRA. It's called, called the Jerusalem Declaration. Uh, and it will be uh, announced shortly at the time of their choosing when they think it's going to make the most uh, impact and have the most effect. So what we'll be, we'll be faced with here is especially uh, a liberal Zionist case for uh, suggesting that there is a serious problem of anti-Semitism or Judeophobia uh, in this country when there, there isn't a serious problem. Um, and uh, the, they will try and get that back on the, uh, on the agenda. So we face a massive battle over that. Now, this is a battle which is going on, not just at UCL, but uh, throughout all of the universities that, uh, in this country. Uh, as some of you will know, I've been attacked um, uh, and complained about by the head of the Bristol JSOC, the, the Jewish Society, along with the, the president of the Union of Jewish Students, um, who are, which are, both of which organizations are, of course, formerly members of the Zionist movement. They are, are all part, the, the JSOCs are all part of the UJS. The UJS is a member of the World Union of Jewish Students, which is a direct member of the World Zionist Organization and in its, uh, constitu its, its constitution, the UJS, uh, of course, mentions uh, being pro-Israel. So that's those kinds of complaints have been made a, a, across the country in different places. They, one against me in Bristol, there's been one in, in Warwick, again made by uh, a UGS uh, or JSOC uh, person, and there have been several others. And we will continue to see this attempt to drive the possibility of anybody speaking out about um, Palestine or about what Zionism is or uh, having any kind of critical account of Zionism as racism or settler colonialism, uh, etc., and, and we we have to to fight back against that. And the way to fight back against it is to organise proper debates and to get people to understand the issues, but not to be fooled by the idea that there is some kind of liberal Zionist panacea which is not as bad as the IHRA in some respects. We have to make sure that we are properly across those debates uh, and and can fight back against them when when they are launched, which they will be very shortly. So I, I, this is a, a problem for, for freedom of speech. I'm going to finish now for, for freedom of speech and also for, for academic freedom. You know, the, 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 the complaint about me was, uh, was about a lecture that I gave on Islamophobia, uh, where I said that um, one of the, what, what I've called the five pillars of Islamophobia is parts of the Zionist movement. Now, this is simply a matter of fact, the Zionist movement. Uh, uh, parts of it are engaged in, in deliberately fostering Islamophobia. It's uh, it's fundamental to the 
to, to, to Zionism to uh, encourage uh, Islamophobia and anti-Arab racism too. Um, and and the, the pressure that they're, that they're um, mounting here is to try and get us to stop teaching this stuff, to stop writing about it and speaking about it in public, and indeed to stop researching it. So, so we, can't, we can't properly go around about researching um, Zionism or the Israeli state or the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, which is of course behind this whole anti-Semitism crisis, uh, because uh, it, to do so will be in, somehow, in some way anti-Semitic. So I think this is a, this is a valuable effort to, to focus on the issue of free speech, but we must also remember, as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, academic freedom, which is uh, a specific and separate uh, act uh, right, as you as you will you will know in the Education Act, uh, and lastly to say that you know that, that it's not just that we want to be able to speak, you know we want to be able to win as well as to speak, uh, and that's what I would uh, want us to remember. Thank you very much, comrade.